And welcome, friends, to this edition of the Grace Hour, broadcasting live once again here from our studios, which are located at the home of the Greater Grace World Outreach right here in beautiful Baltimore, Maryland. Great to be with you, friends, on this Monday morning. And we're starting a brand new week of broadcasting. We appreciate you taking the time to join us. Hope you'll stay with us for the next hour. We'll have a devotional word, get things started in our broadcast today, and then, of course, we'll move on from that devotion to opening the phone lines and inviting you to join us live on the broadcast on this Monday morning. You can do so simply by picking up a phone, dialing one of the following numbers, and then participating in our broadcast today. Uh, This week's theme, friends, what it means to lift truth out of the street. And the scripture, of course, reminds us that truth has fallen in the street. How do we lift it out? And how can we exalt the truth and promote the truth and magnify the truth in the world that we live in today? I think all of us would agree that the culture keeps moving in one direction and the kingdom of God is moving in another direction. And it's so vital that we again come to the realization, the understanding of the truth, find a way to lift it out of the street, and again, put it before the eyes of those in our world, our culture today. That's going to be our theme this week on the Grace Hour, and we hope that you'll participate when those phone lines are open. It's quite simple. Get to a phone, dial one of these numbers. Toll free in all of North America is 800-338-7060, and the local number for you to join us live on the Grace Hour on this Monday morning is 410-483-3700. And that local number is for all of our friends listening and watching locally right here in the Baltimore area. I want to welcome everyone live, gracehour.org, YouTube Live, Facebook Live. Once again, a pleasure to have all of you with us. Hope you'll stay with us for the full hour-long broadcast. You can also listen to the broadcast And, well, our platforms are many these days, such as Apple, Google, Spotify, Audible, Stitcher, Amazon Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, just to name a few. So, again, there's ample opportunity for you to tune in and listen to the broadcast live. Or, if you're unable to listen to the broadcast live, you can catch up with us later. Archive any of our broadcasts and tune in that way. Uh, We're excited about this week's theme and looking forward to a week of broadcasts that essentially will allow us to magnify the truth of the gospel, the truth about who Christ is, and the truth, of course, of the finished work of Christ. So stay with us if you're able to. And again, when those phone lines are open, your participation in the broadcast, well, we always look forward to it. Don't think for a moment that what you have to share or the question that you have to ask is unimportant or insignificant. Uh, Your contribution to the broadcast is crucial. So we look forward to hearing from you and hope to hear from many of you as we start a brand new week of broadcasting on this Monday morning live on the Grace Hour. Joining me in the studio today to share the Monday morning devotional, Pastor Matt Garrett. Welcome. Thank you, Pastor Love. Always a pleasure to be here. Uh, Since we're going to be talking about wisdom, I think it's only fitting that we start in the book of Proverbs, the very book that uh, goes in-depth on wisdom. So I'm going to be reading from Proverbs chapter 1 today. We will try to cover verses 20 through 33 in their their entirety. And uh, let's just pray very quickly and ask God to give us a great show. Jesus, thank you so much for allowing us to do this, God. Give us uh, your your words, your wisdom, your thoughts. Help us to be uh, filled with your wisdom on a daily basis. Help us to live uh, practically with your wisdom and to be able to apply it uh, in every aspect of our lives. Jesus, we just ask that you help us to lift you up this morning and that you would draw listeners and men and women, to to your saving grace today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in Proverbs chapter 1, I'll read four verses to start, verses 20 through 23. It says, Wisdom cries without. She utters her voice in the streets. 
She cries in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she utters her words, saying, How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. So as I'm reading these verses, I'm thinking to myself as I'm going through, okay, where is wisdom? Where is it? It's very, it's very clearly stated there in verse 20 and verse 21. Where is wisdom? It is, it is without. It is in the streets in verse 20. It is in the chief place, in the openings of the gates, in the city, uh, wisdom is crying out to us. So I think about that and I look at wisdom and I look at the world around us today and, and I think of a few things that, that could be speaking wisdom to us if we, if we just think about it for a second. If we turn to Psalm chapter 19 and look at verses 1 through 6, the Bible is very clear in telling us that uh, God speaks to us through his creation. In Psalm 19 verse 1 it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork, the heavens being the skies. There's actually three heavens in the Bible. We won't get into that today. The firmament, the earth, the ground, the, the soil shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. Every single day the sun comes up, the sun goes down. The moon comes out, <clears throat> maybe hidden by clouds, and then it goes away. Right? Every single day, day unto day, utter speech night unto night shows knowledge where is wisdom it's in nature it's in everything happening around us in the <clears throat> garden of eden there was no uh rain there was no watering of the herbs and the plants and there was no way for man to understand how all of this vegetation grew and was sustained other than adam knowing god eve knowing god and god taking care of everything but in, in the time that we live today, what do we have? It, it's, it, you learn this in maybe fourth grade science class. What do we, what do we have on a, on a daily basis that occurs all throughout the world? We have the water cycle. We have the water cycle. It speaks to us. It tells us like, that the earth is taking care of itself because of the way God set things up, because of the, the wisdom that God used to create this earth. Wisdom is in nature. If you continue reading, it says, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun. There is not a place on this planet where nature does not speak to people, not a single place. And in God's wisdom, he uses nature to reveal who he is and his, his glory and his handiwork. He uses that to speak to people. Where is wisdom? It's out in the streets. It's out in nature. It's out in the Amazon forest. It's out in Antarctica where there is like very little life, but snow covering everything. And even that, that uh, terrain and environment serves a purpose in God's mind. Where is it? It's in, it's in nature. Where else, where else could we say wisdom is based on it being out in the streets, it speaking to us on a daily basis? Well, we look through our cities and we look at these tall buildings, small buildings, little shacks maybe, uh, houses, uh, residential areas. We look at all of those things and we have no problem as humans saying, yeah, hey, someone built that. Hey, someone designed that, built it, constructed it, and it's standing there and we see it and it speaks to us. But when it comes to God being out in the streets speaking to us, we, for some reason, people won't acknowledge God as the creator of heaven and earth. People won't say, yeah, there's clear design to this water cycle where the rain comes down and then uh, it evaporates and clouds form. I, I'm, I'm skipping a step, but it comes down again. Okay, there's four steps in the water cycle. I don't teach science. I'm sorry. It's, it's there. I don't teach meteorology. Um, we, we fail to acknowledge God in those things. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, it says this very clearly. Uh, let's read that just for a moment. Romans chapter 1, maybe verses 19 and 20 actually, says this. 
uh, because that <clears throat> which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And, and just this first part of verse 21, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. When you look out at nature, when you look at the grand design of, of man-made things, and then you look at the grand design of God-made things, we, we have, again, no problem praising man, but we have a lot, a lot of issues with giving credit and preeminence to God for his creation. So wisdom, wisdom is there. It's right in front of our face. It's in, it's in our everyday lives. So if you turn to Romans chapter 10 and you read a few verses, I, I had this phrase in my, in my mind whenever I was thinking about this. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 18, it says, have you not heard? Have you not heard wisdom? Have you not heard it? It's out in the streets. Have you not gone down to the inner harbor here in Baltimore City and found a man with a little with a uh, a little speaker attached to a headset microphone, and he's just preaching out there the word of God. He's just preaching salvation in Christ. How many of us have walked right by that man? How many of us have not paid any attention to that person? But where is wisdom? It's out in the streets. It's right there. It's right down there on the red bricks in the inner harbor. It's right, it's right there. It's, uh, it's coming up, knocking on your door sometime, handing you a track at some point in your life. Someone standing on a street corner, handing out little pieces of paper that say, God loves you. God, God cares for you. God has forgiven you. Sin is real in our lives, and, and he has made a way to take care of it. Where is wisdom? It's, it's right there. It's in the streets. Uh, so whenever we read, when we think about that, have you not heard? Have you not heard? I think Isaiah 53, 1 says, they have not, be- will they believe our report? They have not believed our report. So let's go back to Proverbs chapter 1. We know that wisdom is there. It's in the streets. We, we just talked about it. a couple different ways we can maybe see it or recognize it. So the next question we have to ask ourselves when we think about it, it's right there in front of us. It's sometimes smacking us in the face with its presence, we have to ask ourselves, how do we miss it? How do we miss wisdom if it's right there crying in the streets? What is taking our attention away from wisdom? Well, that's, that's a really simple answer in this day and age. <clears throat> I don't know if you're, if you're watching online, uh, but, but here, here we have it right here. Look at this little device that I'm holding up. It lights up every time I move it. Every time I move it, it catches my attention. Sometimes the sun hits it just right where it glares off of it, and I think it lights up, and I have to check it, okay? I I looked up this study. What's one of the biggest distractions uh, to humanity today to not hear wisdom, to not see wisdom, to not receive wisdom? It's screen time. (laughs) It's screen time. Whether it be your phone, uh, the television, the Internet, uh, your work computer, your laptop, Whatever it is, I looked up a study the Kaiser Family Foundation did on just 8 to 18-year-olds in America today. Do you have any idea how much time they average on screens? And, and this average, this number that they calculated has nothing to do with educational time, just, just leisure time. How many hours do they spend on screens, 8 to 18 years old? Seven and a half hours per day. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Wisdom is crying out in the streets. It is right there for the taking. It is right there for you to pick up and receive it. And you are looking down on a little screen focused on whatever is happening inside that little device. For seven and a half hours of your day, you're distracted. Phones alone for this age group, uh, three hours a day is the average screen time on just your phone. That's not TV. That's not computer. Again, that's discluding educational purpose purposes. When you average this out and you, uh, you look at a whole year's worth of time, 114 days out of your 365 and a quarter day year are spent looking at a screen. 114 days spent looking at a screen. So do we have distractions? Do we have things that keep us from hearing wisdom? Do we have things whenever wisdom is crying out in the chief place of concourse and the openings of the gates in the city, she's uttering her words We are the ones loving simplicity in verse 22. We are the ones 
loving, whatever catches our attention, whatever gives us that little hit, uh, those, those endorphins, whatever gives us that little buzz, that's, that's, what, that's what we're about. That's why we miss it. So screen time, one of the biggest distractions. Uh, a couple of other distractions, just, just thinking about things. Uh, the time you spend working, the time you spend uh, outside of productive hours in your life and, and you're just working because you have nothing else to do, you could be se- seeking after wisdom. You could be seeking after wisdom. Uh, athletics, I love athletics. I am a big proponent of sports. Uh, com- competing, playing, enjoying, uh, but but also sometimes we take it too far, and some people will spend three, four hours in the weight room training uh, when they could be doing they could be training their godliness in First Timothy instead. Um, mindfulness, mindfulness, another another simple distraction where we try to get to know ourselves void of God, outside of God's uh, presence, and we are just totally focused on ourselves. Uh, maybe, maybe the next biggest distraction apart from those things, it says it in verse 22 of Proverbs one, it says, we love simplicity. We love simplicity. Do you know what that word simplicity means? We love open-mindedness. We love to be carried about to and from whichever way the waves are going, whichever direction society is taking us. We love to go with the flow. It's simple. It's not, it's not hard. We're not going against anything. It's, it allows us to, to, to shift. It allows us to change shapes. It allows us to change colors like a chameleon. Uh, it allows us to say that love is love. It allows us to say that gender is fluid or liquid. It allows us to say that definitions can change. You guys want a funny example of a definition that has recently changed? I have no intention of being political here. I'm just saying this is true. This is happening in the world right now. Uh, the definition of the word recession has changed because the political party in power doesn't like the fact that there have been two negative quarters in our GDP growth, uh, which is the textbook definition of recession. But because we're simple, because we are keen to believe any and everyone and, and respect everything that they have to say and what they want to believe and how they want to live their lives, definitions can change. Uh, love is not love. God is love in 1 John 4, 8 and 4, 16. Uh, there is no greater love than this in John 15, 13, that a man would lay down his life for his brethren. It is not about all of these other socioeconomical or political points that people make it to be. It is not about widespread acceptance of every person for everything, for every idea they have in their lives. Sin is sin. God is love. And God has dealt with sin in his love. Uh, if we choose to listen and follow after it, if we choose to receive that. Uh, so what is, what is wisdom's cry? Okay, we know where it is. We know uh, what's keeping us from hearing it. So when we do finally hear it, I got to ask you, what do you think it's saying to you? What is wisdom saying to you? Uh, what did God say to Adam in the garden in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9? He said, Adam, where are you? I think when wisdom is crying out to us and we have never heard it before or we have never listened to it and we have never tried to to actually follow after it, the first thing it might be saying to us is, hey, Matt, hey, Pastor Love, hey, Sebastian, hey, Tom, hey, where are you? Where are you? And I think about this as like in the situation, Adam is ashamed. He just ate of the fruit that God told him not to eat of. He just He just did something that he knows goes against God's order. So he's hiding behind a tree. And I think wisdom is crying out, where are you? So that when you answer back, wisdom can say to you, hey, listen, you are not your sin. You are not the thing that makes you ashamed in your life. You are something totally different. Do you know that your sin is a product product of something in the Bible that we call the old sin nature? Did you know that God dealt with our old sin nature and he says that you are a new creation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17? He says, old things have passed away, including your old sin nature. Is it something we deal with as believers? Yes, I'm not talking about that. But is it something that we can move on from that when we have a relationship with wisdom, who, by the way, the epitome, the personification of wisdom is Jesus Christ, when we have a relationship with wisdom, we can say, no, I am a new creation. I, 
it's, all things are new. I do not have to be ashamed of my sin. I do not have to identify as my sin. And whenever we get to that point and we're listening and we're looking for wisdom again, wisdom might be saying something else to us. In Psalm 27 and verse 8, David recalls in his psalm, when God said to him, seek my face, David says, your face, Lord, did I seek. Your face, Lord, did I seek. Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things in life will be added unto you. All of your worries that you're that you're consumed by all the anxiety that that <clears throat> that worries you. Uh, Matthew, the gospel writer, says, "Like look at the birds, look at the flowers, look at the way that God takes care of everything in His nature. Nature crying out wisdom to us. If you seek God, if you seek His face, if you receive by faith what God has to say for you in your life, then wow, you have a whole different world opening up to you, a whole different world where you get to apply." the wisdom that is crying out to you. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, 21, we said, we said that men glorified God not as God when they knew him, right? Uh, later on, when Jesus is walking, walking the earth in Luke chapters 22 and 23, and he's going, getting ready to be crucified, the whole crowd is screaming, crucify him. The whole crowd is yelling out, crucify him. Uh, what does God say to those people? What is wisdom crying out to those people? Luke 23, verse 34, Jesus Christ up on the cross says, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they've done. They know not what they do. Your guilt does not define you. Your bad mistakes, your past mistakes does not make you any less of a child of God in this life or the next. In Proverbs 26 and verse 13 Uh, If you're fearful or in context of Proverbs 26, if you're lazy, the word in the King James is slothful, you might say, there's a lion in the streets. I don't want to go out in the streets. Wisdom is crying from the streets. It's not a lion. The, The devil is a lion seeking whom he may devour. But I tell you what, he is not in the streets. He's hiding in the gutters. He's hiding in the sewers. He's hiding in the places inside your home where you are occupied in front of your screens and he is keeping you focused on those things. The only lion in the streets is Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah. And he is crying out to you, come and be with me. Proverbs 1, verse 33, the very last verse of of chapter 1. Whoso hearkens unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. There is no lion in the street that you need to be afraid of. There is nothing that is keeping you really from hearing wisdom cry out to you, except, except what you deem to be more important at the time, in the moment, the simple thing that you like to follow after. And we're, we're all guilty of this. I'm not saying you, I'm, I'm talking to myself just as much. So, so how do we, how do we get past this? We have to listen for what, for wisdom. What does it say in Romans 10, 17? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Uh, have you ever opened your Bible before and read a verse? Turn, turn there. Turn to Romans 10, 17 and read that verse. Read it to yourself out loud and ask God to give you faith. Ask God to give you wisdom. He is calling out to you, asking you to receive it. Receive it by faith. Uh, in the same way that we receive Jesus Christ by faith, we receive wisdom by faith. And we just want to give you that opportunity this morning before we get into the rest of our program. If you have never received Christ, if you have never listened for wisdom crying out to you from the streets, well, God tells us that he sent his son to die for you, to pay for your sins, the sins of the whole world in 1 John 2, 2, Isaiah 53, verse 7 and 8. The whole, all, all iniquity is upon him. And if you believe in him and you put your faith in him, he will restore you. He will make you a new creation. He will will raise you up into heavenly places and you will start to hear wisdom on a daily basis. Open your Bibles, read a proverb a day, read a psalm a day, uh, get get wisdom inside of you and watch what God does, does in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, You're listening live to the Grace Hour, friends, on this Monday morning. And that wraps up the devotional portion of our broadcast you shared with us today. Pastor Matt Garrett, and he's going to stay with us in the studio. We're going to open the phone lines 
and begin to take your questions, comments, testimonies, counseling needs. If you have a prayer request, we don't want you to hesitate to reach out to us, and we will cover those prayer requests as we receive them. But join us live. The phone lines are open, 800-338-7060. That's toll-free, of course, uh, throughout North America, Canada, and the United States. And right here in the Baltimore area, friends, you can join us live locally at 410-483-3700. Our good friend Dietmar has written to us, um, giving us a couple of scriptures that just to continue to highlight our theme about wisdom, God's wisdom, and finding it and taking it into our hearts. Uh, he quotes from the Amplified Version of the Bible in Ephesians 5.16, says, making the most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using those opportunities with wisdom and diligence. Then from Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, the scripture reminds us to set our minds and keep focused habitually on the things that are above, the heavenly things, not the things that are here on the earth. Great thoughts and some great portions of scripture. You know, it when you think of the wisdom, the wisdom, well, we have to differentiate between the wisdom of this world and the wisdom that the scripture speaks about. Um, Paul, while writing to the Corinthians, talked about the foolishness of human wisdom hmm. and started in the first chapter of Second Corinthians by asking the question, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom did not know God, and it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And then in verse 24, he says, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, that's a stumbling block. To the Greeks, that's foolishness. But unto them that are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And then, of course, to those that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, accept him as their Savior, they themselves, in verse 30, become wisdom before God. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. The, the great gulf that's fixed between the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of God, uh, it, it's, it's night and day. It's darkness and light. And Paul, when writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, he said something that characterizes our present culture. And it may be happening, well, it is happening every day in our world. They are ever learning. Mm. But notice the word, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because they're operating in a wisdom from below, not with a wisdom that's from God. And when you're operating with a wisdom from below, from this world, you can be ever learning. You can you know, finish high school, go to college, get your bachelor's degree, get your master's degree, uh, you know, <laughs> get your PhD, and you can be ever learning, but never able to come. Why? Because God says, listen, I'm going to confound the wisdom of this world, because the world has their ideas. They have their understanding. And I think, I think you pointed out early on in your devotional that what, what, what is wisdom? It's not knowledge. It's not understanding. It's the application of knowledge and understanding. And if you don't get that knowledge from God, again, you'll fall into that category where you'll be ever learning. Imagine education, more education, more education. <laughs> and, and, and that word that appears in the scripture, never, never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah, and, and it's also uh, interesting when we do apply wisdom, I read this from, from my former Bible college roommate the other day. Uh, when we do apply wisdom, it has to be applied in or after the heart of God. It cannot be applied based on your own judgment of what the Bible says. And it can't be applied based on how you feel that verse. It says in 
maybe First Peter or Second Peter, there is no scripture that is of private interpretation. Uh, it has to line up <clears throat> with who God is, what God says, what His character is, and we don't we don't give wisdom in we don't apply we don't we don't give application to anything if we first don't have the heart of God. It says in the book of Matthew. It might also say in the book of James that mercy reigns over judgment. And if we are not in tune with the mercy of God first, the grace of God that he has poured out on us, then then any wisdom that we attain is just like that wisdom that's gained in the world. It's just like that stuff that we can fill ourselves with and never actually be full because we haven't, we haven't accepted the full person of who God is. Like his holiness is amazing, right? His righteousness is unfound. Like no one can come close to his righteousness. And we know this. So if we start to preach God's holiness and God's righteousness at people, but we don't include the aspect of the fact that God has made a way to make us righteous like him, we could preach to them Matthew 5, uh, 48. I think it's 48 where it says, be holy as I am holy. Also in first Peter chapter one, verse 16, maybe 18, be holy as I am holy. Oh, in Matthew 5, 48, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. We could preach that to people and we could call that wisdom. But if we aren't first telling them that God has given us a, a, a clear pathway to enter into that perfection, to enter into that righteousness, to enter into that holiness through his mercy, through his love, through his grace, then, then we're not even applying wisdom. We're just, we're just learning, 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 taking in Bible knowledge, Bible facts, and spitting things out completely void of the heart of God. And I just think about that from a believer's point of view too, that uh, in Second Timothy, he's talking about unbelievers, right? But, but the same thing can happen to us as believers. Mm, absolutely. Phone lines are open. You can join us, 800-338-7060. That's toll-free in all of North America and right here in Baltimore. Give us a call at 410-483-3700. And you can join us live on the broadcast. Your comments, questions, testimonies, all welcome on this Monday morning edition of the Grace Hour. Well, we understand the importance of wisdom and operating in it and having it in our lives. I suppose if wisdom is in the streets, then how do we go about getting it and, and applying it in our lives? And I can't help but think that it comes down to our choice. We have to make that choice. Mm -hmm. We have to look at, at what God says is wisdom and then decide, uh, it, do I want that? Um, I heard something yesterday, it was kind of humorous, but it really illustrates this point. Um, a story about a young man in college, and he was always a, rather uh, frustrated at the fact that his college professor uh, was always right about everything. <laughs> and, and no matter what the subject matter was, no matter what the issue was being discussed, he was always right. So one day, he was so frustrated about it. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get one up over on him. Oh, I'm going to go into the class. And what he did, he said, he said I have a little bird uh, in my hand, and I'm not going to show it to him. And I'm going to ask him just so that I can finally you know, make, you know, get him to, to prove that he, he's not right about everything. I'm going to ask him this question. Is this bird dead or alive? And... He said, if he says the bird is alive, he says, then I'm going, to, I'm going to squeeze it and I'm going to kill the bird and then the bird will be dead. If he oh, says geez. the bird is dead, then I'm going to open my hand and show him that the bird is alive. Wow. So he went in, approached his professor, and he said, now answer this question for me. Is this bird in my hand dead or alive? And of course, he's hoping, finally, I got him for first time ever. And you know what the professor said to him? The choice, the answer, he said, is in your hand. <laughs> the answer is in your hand. Oh, man. And when it comes to getting wisdom, it's in, it's in our hand. It's your choice. It's your decision. And there is a proverb that says that wisdom is too high for a fool. What does that speak about? Mm. Is, it, is it too high from, the, you know, from an intellectual perspective? Is it too, can't grasp it because we don't have that capacity? No. 
too high a price to pay. Wow. Will there be a price to pay for one to get wisdom in their soul? Will it cost you something? Perhaps, but it's still your choice. The answer is in your hand. Wow. <clears throat> There's another proverb, uh, k- kind of similar vein as that. Uh, Proverbs 17, 24, that says, Wisdom is before the man that has understanding. Wisdom is before him that has understanding. But the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth. Uh, and so, yeah, the choice is in our hands, right? Um, what is what is the most sold book? What is the number one New York Times bestseller year after year after year, but the least read book in all of, in all of the world? I'm going to guess, but it's probably wrong. Is it the Bible? It's the Bible. It's the Bible. The Bible has consistently been one of the top uh, number. It, it's been number one for many years on the New York Times bestseller list, but it's also just been like close to the top on the years that it's not number one. And uh, what do most people do with those Bibles? If you have an Airbnb or a hotel, what do you do with those Bibles? You you stick it in the side table uh, next to the light, next to the bed, just in case someone would ever want to read it or to make them think that you're like a, you know, a different person than what you really are. I don't know. Uh, but what, like, the wisdom is before him that has understanding. We have the Bible right in front of us. For most of the nations in the world, it is written in their language. Not every single nation, but most nation in the world, it is written in their language. They have access to it. The internet gives you access to it if you have any sort of satellite or, or cable connectivity to it. It is before him that has understanding. But where... Where is the fool's eyes? The fool's eyes are in the ends of the earth. The fool's eyes are on, on, on that goal that they set for themselves that has nothing to do with God. It's in, it's in that uh, education that they want to keep going after and keep growing in and keep getting accolades. It's in that business venture that they, that they go on that just, they just want to gain this amount of money, but then they want to gain this amount of money and then that amount of money and then, and then have so much money that you don't even think about money anymore when actually in reality all you'll be thinking about is the amount of money that you have. The fool's eyes are in the ends of the earth. Wisdom is before him. It is right in front of us. It is, it is right there. Um, we were talking about distractions earlier too in, in, my, in the devotional. We have like the screen time. We have uh, work. We have athletics. We have leisure. We have all of these different things that we do. Now think back, think back to <clears throat> right around the time that Jesus was born. And how few of these distractions that we have today they would have had. They had they had distractions, sure. They had their own set of distractions, but not like the ones that we have, not all the technologically driven ones that we have. Do you know what happened in Matthew chapter 2? In the very town where it's prophesied that Christ will be born, do you know what happened? Everyone was distracted. Herod was distracted. Uh, all the people... In the town, we're distracted. In the little village, we're distracted. A star appeared and stayed there for probably roughly two years right above them. They never saw it. They never noticed it. There was a prophecy written uh, years and years before that they never paid any attention to. Wisdom was right before them. But they had, they had their eyes on other things. They had their festivals that they had to keep. They had their laws that they had to uphold. They had uh, the Romans that they had to worry about. They had all of these different things that they were focused on. Uh, and Christ was being born in a manger in their very village. Now, what did it take for them to take any notice of any of this? It took three wise men from the east. Three wise men who, when the star appeared, started a very long, probably over 2,000 kilometer journey from Babylon or where Babylon used to be to where Christ was born. Uh, That's why Herod gives the order once he speaks with the wise men for for any children under the age of two to be slaughtered because it probably took them that long to get there. They had two years to realize that the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with them, was actually with them, living with them. That blows my mind. That's, that's a testimony to all of us today of how easy, how simple uh, we have it, that wisdom could be right in front of us. It says in John chapter 1 that, that Christ came into the world that he created, and the world did not even know who.
who he was. We have the Bible, which is the word which he has created and, and written for us. And if we don't ever open it, it can be a New York Times number one bestseller for years to come. And if people don't open it and read it and, and see what God has done for them, then they're, they're just, <laughs> their eyes are going to be in the ends of the earth for as long as, as long as they're alive. And then, and then, uh, and then the portion that I didn't cover in Proverbs chapter one, verses 24 through 32, and then it'll be too late. If you read that, it's, it's a picture of hell. It's like a really kind of, uh, hard, hard set of verses to read, but it basically says that when you get to the point where you've had all these opportunities, where wisdom has been crying out to you over and over again, where it has been right in front of you nonstop, the time where you actually cry out to it is too late. It's, it's when you're already in hell, when you're already being tormented, when you're already being um, tortured. Uh, that's, that's kind of a sour note, but maybe we can, <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> maybe we can it's, change it's, that. Yeah. If you don't embrace the, the wisdom of God, then the antithesis, uh, the other side of that coin is, you know, you, you forsake you, your own mercy. And as a result, you could be separated from God throughout all of eternity. And, and this is what, you know, when it comes to the wisdom of God, it's, as you said earlier in your devotional, it's summed up in the person of Christ, who spoke of himself in these terms, John fourteen six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it's incredible to think that Jesus stood before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, and Pilate asked him to his face, what is truth? I mean, if you and I were present with the understanding that God has given us, we could say, Pilate, you're looking at it. Right in front of you. This yeah. is the personification of truth. We could also say this is the personification of wisdom. When Simeon found mm -hmm. the child, when his parents brought him to the temple to dedicate him to the Lord in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, he took that child in his hands and lifted him up, and he said that mine eyes have seen God's salvation in the person of Christ. This is the wisdom of God. But yet the wisdom of God in the eyes of men is foolishness. So how can we, given the nature of uh, so many distractions that let's say this present generation is dealing with and facing with today, how is it possible for us to try to reach them, to, to, to get them to open their eyes to see the wisdom of God? in the person of Christ, as opposed to reaching out to the ends of the earth and following all of these present-day distractions? It's a great question. It's, it's a, there's, there's probably multiple ways of thinking about that. Um, and I don't, I don't want to like say one side is any better than the other or one way is any better than the other. I'm just going to say it this way because this is the way I understand it, not attacking anyone. Old school thought process would be uh, get them into a church, let them hear the message, okay? Get them into a church, let them hear, go out and evangelize, bring them in, let them hear a message. What we're doing right now is like different from that, but we're still giving the message. And we're trying to reach them on all these platforms we mentioned at the beginning of the show. All of these platforms are platforms that they use for all these other distractions. And if they just happen to stumble upon this, it's like, that's a possibility. Uh, whenever Christ uh, came to the world, he came to be with them exactly where they were. Whenever he went to Zacchaeus in the tree, he went and he went into Zacchaeus' house and he, he dined with him regardless of his reputation, regardless of what he did in his life, and he was just personal with him. And he was just reaching into his life. So in the same way, we're, we're trying to do that through like a radio broadcast. Uh, there's... YouTube videos out there of evangelism that takes place. There's this one called Falling Plates on YouTube. If you've never seen Falling Plates on YouTube, please watch it. If you're not a believer, watch Falling Plates and see if that makes any sense to you. Uh, the way that, the, that our brains are wired today with all the screen time, with all the technology, our, our attention span is so short that if we don't have something moving in front of us, catching our attention, driving the endorphins in our brain to like, you know, light things up in, in a sense in our brains. 
then we're going to lose interest and, and like people won't be able to, you know, they, they can't come in for an hour and a half church service and sit and listen. Like they have to pull out their phone and do something and scroll and, and whatever. Right. Um, there's so many different ways we can approach it. We go, we go to where they are. Paul said that I became all things to all men so that some might be saved. We go to the, the areas that they are at. We, we go to the online platforms. We go uh, into uh, the skate park. We go into <clears throat> the, the athletic complex and we, we gather guys around and we preach a message at halftime or, or you know, like what, what you guys do with the New York Knicks. You go before a game starts and anyone who wants to, you know, receive a positive message before the game, come, come to the, come to the service. Yeah. You know, there's and, so many different ways you can do it. Amen. And we did it again this past weekend with, uh, Bill Alexson as we did the chapel services for another one of these former NBA, uh, programs where these are players that can no longer play at the level of the NBA, but they're still quite quite good oh, yeah. at their profession. Oh, so yeah. there's another league called the Big Three. And we went down to Dallas, Texas this past weekend, and we had several chapel services where all of these athletes, some former greats and some present-day athletes, and we just, you know, shared the gospel. you got to bring it to them. And I, as you said, they may not come out and look for it and seek for it, but if you bring it to them and confront them, and I think that this goes back to this great truth about confrontational evangelism mm -hmm. um sure if we just sit in our church pews and we wait for them to come and hear the message from the pulpit uh they won't come yeah we have to go where they are we have to sit where they sit and we have to bring the gospel to them because how you know the, the romans the 10th chapter says how are they going to hear unless somebody preaches absolutely and how will they uh hear the message unless somebody goes so mm -hmm. that principle yes it's old school but it's the only way to get the message out. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, evangelism, 100%. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about... Even even you, the present, yes, the platforms <clears throat> that we can use today. No yeah. question about it. Yeah, I think, yeah, what I was referring to was more that l what you said, like the sitting and waiting part, it's it's not going to happen. Yeah. It's just not going to... How many people drive to get off 95 and go over to Route 40 and never notice at all that there's two churches right here on this street like that they're driving by? How, sure. ma how many of them are going to do that the rest of their lives and never notice on Moravia Park Drive that there's a huge church school uh, complex right here that they can receive the word of God and their lives can be changed with? It's, it's going to happen for as long as we're here. Yeah. But until we go out and find them and invite them and, and speak to them and be personal with them. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like our prayer needs to be God send a crisis into somebody's life because mm. it seems unless our lives are disturbed we would be perfectly content to you know just march straight into a godless eternity we need trouble trouble's not such a bad thing is it no i mean there are even politicians that encourage people to to get involved in good trouble well <laughs> i think god employs bad trouble to get our attention and to bring us to the realization that, look, I have a need that nothing in this world can fulfill, mm -hmm. only God. And it's going to force people to look beyond, you know, their, their present controlled environment and to look beyond that and to say, there's got to be something more. There's got to be an answer and I'm going to pursue it. And maybe when that happens, they may think that they're seeking God, but in reality, we know that God is seeking them. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's go to Lise uh, up in Montreal, uh, Canada, uh, or somewhere in Quebec. Lise, welcome. <laughs> are you in Montreal or are you, you in Quebec City? Quebec City, yay! Oh, amen. Great to have you with us. <laughs> but I'm, I'm very close to you guys in spirit. I mean, uh, very following, following everything that comes uh, from Baltimore. And this morning I was... Uh, I was blessed to hear Pastor Matt, and I thought, uh, well, I have to say hi to him. I, I, yesterday, I had kind of a meeting for Bible school coming very soon. Nice. And I thought, oh, that's funny. He's there this morning, and I wanted to say, well, I'm going to pray for you. For Are you in the preparation? Oh, yeah. New, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. 
I, I have to start my communication with the different uh, teachers and see their availability and, you know, like all the details, the mm-hmm. schedule. And uh, anyway, I, 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 I love the pastor. I, maybe uh, I wasn't sure, but I love, I love this. I, I, I'm not sure if you, if you mentioned it, but you mentioned the proverb 24, huh? that the wisdom uh, by wisdom, a house is built. I think I heard you say that, huh? And by understanding, it is established. Uh, Proverb twenty-four, three. Mm-hmm. The rooms are filled by wisdom, uh, by knowledge. The rooms, and okay. I mean, I, I love. I have always loved that uh, that verse, and uh, just wanted to say, I love the the fact that we fill our room of the, you know, like our soul being a a house, I guess, mm-hmm. and we fill the room. With uh, you know all precious and pleasant riches, I I I don't know. I especially like this this verse, and I wanted to share it with you guys. And also, I wanted to say that you have all my admiration. I, I wanted to say uh, to Pastor Matt that uh, I want to say thank you for loving this generation. Well, actually, both of you, you love this generation, and uh, you you know like uh, you're doing you know more than what is. <laughs> What you know, the maximum that can be done for this generation, and I thank you very much. Like I think Bible school is a, is a good way, but as also you know, like you, as you say, you go reach the people where they are, and uh, it's beautiful, beautiful. And I I admire you very much, and I'm very happy to be, uh, you know, like I don't know in this ministry. Thank you. That was my comment today. <laughs> Thanks, Lise. That was Beautiful, very Lise. kind. Thank yeah. you. Amen. And uh, Lise is very much involved with the Bible College there in Montreal. Mm-hmm. And uh, they have a, a great turnout each and every semester. Yeah. And speaking of wisdom, uh, we have the upcoming fall semester at Maryland Bible College and we Seminary. We certainly do. And as she pointed out, you're in the planning stages of that semester. So what can we expect as we enter into a fall semester of uh, 2022? Well, uh, every fall, we offer a free week of classes to anyone who's never tried out Bible college. Uh, If you are a recent high school graduate, did you know that you get a free year of Bible college if you come straight out of high school to Maryland Bible College and Seminary? We pay for your school fees for the entire first year. You could take two credits or 15 credits, and we would cover it. Uh, It's just something our ministry believes in so greatly that if you come to Bible college, you will have wisdom stored in your soul for the rest of your life. You will have those pleasant riches, that knowledge, filling your rooms of your soul uh, so that you can attack all the different aspects of life in God's, in God's, with God's mind. And what about some of our listeners who maybe are thinking, well, I don't know if I am looking for some formal training um, to enter into the work of the ministry in some capacity. But I just want to be able to go to a Bible college class and learn more about the Bible. Is that possible? And if that is, what are some of the courses that are going to be offered this fall? Yeah, so that, that is definitely possible. So our evening schedule is really kind of dedicated to those people who are, who are coming, going through the program, trying to get an associate's or a bachelor's degree. But we offer morning classes on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Friday mornings uh, throughout the semester, fall or spring. And these are always free to attend uh, just as an auditor, which means you're just sitting in. You're not required to do the coursework. You're just hearing from the Word of God on different topics. So on Wednesday mornings, we are going to have Leadership One, which is actually the book of 1 Timothy, Wednesday mornings, 8.30 to 10.20. On Thursday mornings, We are going to have Bible Survey 1, where you get to go from Genesis the whole way through Song of Solomon and get a general overview of what the Bible is talking about in those books, the purpose of those books. And then on Fridays, we have our very own Pastor Love doing Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Gospels, one of the best classes you could ever sit in on or listen to in Bible college because it is all about what Jesus did, why he came, what he was doing on the earth, the different perspectives of these writers. I, I don't need to say anything about it. You're the one teaching it. You can t- tell us a little bit about the Gospels class. 
Well, it's it's as you said, it's kind of like the fundamentals of Bible college, um, because there may not be a more important or significant part of the entire Bible than those four Gospels, mm-hmm. because they declare the person and the ministry and the entire work of Christ and why he came, as you said, what he accomplished. But, you know, it's interesting because people say, well, I'll, I'll study the Gospels, but there's a difference between the Gospel, w- how we define the mm-hmm. Gospel, and the Gospels. Sure. So it's, I think that if you're going to rightly interpret the Gospels, it's going to help you rightly interpret the rest of the Scripture. Absolutely. And that's something that every Bible college student, or any student of the Bible for that matter, is required to do. Rightly divide the word of truth. Because if you don't rightly divide the Gospels, you could be in a lot of trouble. As you said earlier, yeah. you, you mentioned it. Yeah. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, be, <clears throat> be perfect. There's a lot of people that read the Sermon on the Mount, put the Bible down, <laughs> close it. it, and say, I'm done. Yep. If that's what God's looking for, I can't meet that requirement. <laughs> right? Yes. So we talk about that. Yeah. We discuss that. What does he mean? Mm-hmm. How do you fit the Sermon on the Mount into the context of what the Apostle Paul taught in the epistles? Um, what's the difference between the, the gospel that Jesus spoke about and the gospel that Paul called my gospel? Uh, all of this and more is discussed in that class, so it's fundamental. And it's free, Friday mornings. August 29th is the first week of Bible college. Uh, so what are we looking at? 29, 30, 1, 2, September 3rd, the first free class of the Gospels, September 3rd, 8.30 in the morning to 10.20. If your schedule allows it, please feel free to pop in. Uh, someone will be there to greet you, and you will just love any of those classes that you take. And i got to tell you, it's a great way to start your day. It really is. Yeah. I mean, you come into the classroom, and you got, and it's yes, it's an intensified study, but at the same time, it's very edifying. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're learning truth, and we want to say this. It goes without saying, really. The, these Bible college classes, they do not lack the practical edge mm-hmm. for your life. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is not about all about theology. Sure. There's a practical edge 100%. to these courses Has to. so that you can take it, receive it, apply it to your lives. Yep. So it's exciting, and it's coming up very quickly, friends. We want to remind you, um, how can folks get in touch with maybe being a part of one of these classes sure you can give us a call Uh, our office hours are 12 to 4 each day through the summer that'll pick up to 12 to 7 uh, right around August 22nd 410-488-2606 410-488-2606 God bless your friends we'll be back tomorrow for the next live edition of the Grace Hour join us then